Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, welcome to this talk this afternoon. Uh, we're excited to have Thomas Sands home today. I think we were just talking about his last talk at Microsoft Research was in 1998. So we'd like to hear from him at least once every 10 years to get an update on his, uh, on his reflections and his, uh, his intellectual uh, work. Thomas is a professor in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, he's uh, um, prolific in his research in e-commerce, game theory, uh, core AI, multi-agent systems. Um, in e-commerce, he's looked at auctions and exchanges, um, online uh, negotiation and contracting, uh, voting, safe exchange, coalition formation, uh, and a variety of other topics. Beyond his academic work, he's founder, chairman, and chief scientist of a company. I'm not sure if we call it a startup anymore, but it's a company called CombineNet. Um, which is uh, doing generalized combinatorial auctions, uh, working with many companies in the world, uh, quite a, dealing with uh, handling quite a bit of, uh, of, of, of a flow of dollars. Thomas did his, his PhD uh, and his master's degrees in computer science at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, he, uh, earlier than that, he did his uh, bachelor's uh, and another master's degree um, at Helsinki University of Technology in Finland. Um, he's a recipient of many awards, uh, including um, one that I, that I know quite well, uh, the Computers and Thought Award, um, and uh, he recently became a fellow of the ACM. He's already a fellow of the AAAI um, a couple of years back. So today, Thomas is we, we're showing how we can apply computational methods, uh, data structures, and uh, um, uh, decision making to uh, health de decisions of the of the most um, interesting kinds uh, involving in including the kind that involve exchanging of uh, critical uh, organs in which there's often, often scarce quantities of uh, around around the world uh, and people wait for these kidney exchanges uh, um, sometimes uh, dying while they wait and at Stanford when I did a medical degree we often saw uh, these lists and priorities of pending uh, uh, needs and uh, availabilities. Uh, it's a very challenging problem that he's been working on. And uh, this, uh, an article on this topic just came out in the New England Journal of Medicine recently. So, Thomas. Thinking for a modern kidney exchange. Thank you, Eric. Um, uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity to share some of our thoughts on uh, how as a computer scientist you can save lives directly which has been kind of an unusual opportunity for me. Um, uh, so fir first of all, I'd like to say a few words of thanks. First of all, funding agencies and uh, Microsoft Research has been funding part of this work through Carnegie Mellon's Computational Thinking Center and the National Science Foundation has also been funding part of this work. And the second uh, set of thanks go to my collaborators. I'm going to be talking about results from three different papers, each one with different uh, co-authors. Uh, in this talk. So, um, as Eric said, uh, kidney exchange is an important, uh, or, or kidney failure is an imp important problem, and it can be kind of a very sad situation uh, when that strikes. In the US alone, over 50,000 people get lethal kidney disease each year, and when that happens, it usually affects both kidneys. Um, the traditional treatment is dialysis, and here's a little picture of what dialysis looks like. You hook up a machine to your bloodstream and uh, it takes a lot of time, uh, multiple times a week, hours at a time, and quality of life on dialysis is very low. And uh, um, it, it's a, uh, for a relatively healthy person like myself to think about this, it's, it's hard to believe, but most people actually on dialysis decide to stop the treatment and die instead. Quality of life is so low and in fact, only 12% survive 10 years, although in principle you can go forever. Uh, the real uh, dialysis is just kind of sustaining your life. It doesn't solve the kidney uh, failure problem. Uh, a more permanent solution is a transplant. 
Uh, but the transplant requires that the donor's kidney is compatible with the patient. And the main compatibility issues come from blood type and tissue type, and there are a couple of others. And why do we work on kidneys rather than some other organs? Well, kidneys are by, are by far the most prevalent organ transplant. So uh, if, if you can um, help the kidney problem, you can probably do as much in terms of saving lives as all other organs combined. Uh, as Eric mentioned, there's this waiting list, this national waiting list. These numbers are now about a year old. So you have about 80,000 people on the waiting list. The average wait time is two to five years, depending on the blood type. Deaths while waiting are about 4,000 a year. And there are about 30,000 additions to the list every year. And only about 15,000 come off the list every year. So the list keeps growing about 15,000 a year. So there's a big imbalance between supply and demand of, um, uh, of, of kidneys. And uh, this, you probably read about you know, buying kidneys and so forth. Uh, if that, that's illegal in most countries, and that's not what we'll be talking about here. Uh, what we're talking about here is live donation, where the observation is that you only need one kidney to survive. So uh, if you need a kidney, maybe one of your loved ones would like to donate you one of theirs, and they can live fine, and you can live fine. Uh, the tricky piece is that usually, even if you find a willing donor, there's incompatibility. The blood and the tissue types don't match. So even though you have a willing donor, the donor is incompatible. So you can't go ahead and uh, do the trans uh, transplant. The idea in kidney exchange is then that instead of just looking at one donor and one patient, let's take these donor-patient pairs, which are marked by these circles here, and make a big pool of them and then try to find exchanges of donors in the pool. And if the pool is big enough, maybe it's no longer an off chance that you can get matches. So here's an example. So pair, pair one has an incompatible patient and donor. We have another pair, pair two, where the patient and the donor are incompatible. So maybe, though, the donor from pair one could donate to the recipient in pair two, and the donor in pair two could give to the patient in pair one. This would be what we call a two cycle. Any questions so far? OK. By the way, this is now, as of two years ago, officially legal in the US. So you cannot buy organs for valuable consideration, but kidneys are no longer considered valuable organ, uh, 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 compensation. So you can actually swap kidneys, and this, this is legal. Um, Usually when we do this and we work with some real uh, kidney uh, tr transplantation chains or exchanges as we call them, uh, we have the donors travel to the place of the uh, recipient. So the kidney is actually traveling in the live person. So we don't have to fly the kidney on ice where it gets worse over time. We actually bring it uh, to the operating table inside the donor. So the kidney is actually outside of the person. Uh, only for a small number of minutes. Is, is that fast part of the model? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. So different kidney exchanges have different policies as to whether they allow travel distance to be a consideration. And to me, at least, it's very, I'm used to traveling a lot. Uh, and it seems to me that you know, this life-saving thing should be much higher priority and the devil travel should be a secondary consideration. But there are certain people in the US who are not willing to travel. Uh, long enough to make this uh, happen. So they're willing to give a kidney to their loved one, which is, I would think, a big deal, but they're not willing to travel to an unknown transplant center at the other side of the US. So, so this, is, uh, this is a question. And uh, some of the kidney exchanges allow you to specify constraints like that. Others don't. And you, you could also make it not a constraint, but you could put it on. Uh, we'll talk about weights later. You can also take it into account as weights. Uh, my personal preference, no. Uh, if you're just talking US, uh, you shouldn't put any, uh, allow any such constraints. But that's just my personal bias. Uh, with with uh, one of the kidney exchanges that we've used this uh, work with, uh, they actually do mostly transportation inside donors, but they also do transportation on ice for those donors that uh, don't want to travel. I think that's 
not that great in that the kidney gets worse uh, during transportation, but uh, that's another matter. So that was a two cycle, but in general you could have longer cycles, pair A giving to pair B, giving to pair, pair C, and so forth. Here's an example of what uh, a kidney exchange optimization problem looks like in graph form, and this is a tiny example in the real US wide kidney exchange we'll have, uh, as predicted, about 10,000 pairs, and in the current uh, small kidney exchanges that exist. The biggest ones have about 200 pairs, but this only has five pairs, just so that we can uh, look at it visually. So we have each pair in a node in the graph. Pair consists donor of a donor and a patient who are incompatible. And uh, there's directed edges that uh, show compatibility between pairs. In this example, there are four cycles that could happen. One is a two cycle C1, then there's a two cycle C2, a two cycle C3, and then there's this massive cycle, which is a one, two, three, four cycle uh, around the whole loop. The cycles can have weights to uh, capture different criteria, which we'll talk about later, but for the exposition in the first part of the talk, let's just think of the unweighted case where all of the edge weights are one. And the aim here is to find the maximum weight set of disjoint cycles. Disjoint means that you cannot take more than one kidney out of any donor. So any one of these nodes can be only part of one cycle. And um, uh, maximum weight, well, the weight of a solution is the sum of the weights of the cycles in the solution. Uh, this is actually not just kidney exchange. You could use the same types of algorithms for other barter exchanges. Uh, for example, other organ donation. Uh, DVDs, um, there, there's an exchange for used books called Read It, Swap It. There's an exchange for holiday homes called Intervac. Question? Basically, you, if, if money transactions are allowed, it was discovered, I believe, in the 5th century BC that you know, money economy really simplifies things a lot. So what, why this return to barter? Ah, okay. I illegal to use money. Right, right. yeah, so, so for kidneys it's illegal, uh, illegal to use money, so that's a very strong reason why uh, you want to go to barter. There are other reasons why people like to barter instead of put things on the market. Uh, uh, the, uh, some argue that there's, you know, you save the taxes, you don't pay the taxes and stuff like that. Uh, the, the funniest one that I know of is the National Odd Shoe Exchange where leg amputees exchange shoes. So maybe they can get away with paying only half of the cost of the shoes because they only need one. Um, now, kidney exchange, unlike some of these other exchanges, has a special property, which is there's a cap on the length of the cycle. And usually, we'll call the cap L, and usually, in practice, so far, it's three, four, or five. Why? And the reason, uh, there's actually two reasons. One reason is that there's resource constraints. All of the transplants in the cycle have to happen at the same time. And in fact, the doctors are on cell phones with each other saying, okay, I'm putting the person, the donor under anesthesia now. I'm taking the kidney out now. Why? Well, if, let's say, Eric's uh, loved one receives a kidney before Eric donates one, Eric might say, oh, well, now I have second thoughts and I don't want to donate anymore, and now the cycle fails. So uh, it has to actu actually execute atomically, and that's why it's coordinated in time. But what that means is that executing long cycles is a huge logistical nightmare. You need, uh, if you want to do a K cycle, you need 2K two, two operating rooms between 3K and 6K doctors and around 4K nurses. And the biggest cycle that has been executed to date was a 6 cycle, but that was kind of a, uh, showing that you know, it can be done, but in practice, usually three or four cycles. What is the, what is the typical bound in time between the donations of all the people in a particular cycle? No, the, no, no, no time gap. The, the kidneys come out at the same moment. All of them? All donor kidneys come out at the same moment. That seems like a really harsh constraint. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it's very important. Sounds like it should be relaxed. Well, one, one could ask the question, well, why do these have to, have to happen atomically at all? Can't we just write a contract that you'll give a kidney and so on? Well, in the US, it's illegal to contract for organs. So you can't write a contract for the organ. 
So, so the only way to enforce it is to make it happen atomically. Literally starting at the exact same moment. Literally at the same moment, coordinated by cell phones. That's pretty wild. Uh, yep. You, you don't see a way out of... I'll, I'll talk about one way, partial way out, but that's a, actually, actually it's not really a solution to this problem, it's a solution to a much bigger problem uh, called altruistic donor chains. Uh, I'll talk about that later. Okay. Um, the other reason why you don't want long cycles is that um, there's a last minute check. After we've done the blood tests that say that you know, these people are compatible, there's a last minute check called the cross match where you actually take their bloods, put them together and shake it and see if it coagulates, if it cakes. If it coagulates, then you can't go ahead with a transplant anyway. So last minute, meaning two or one or two weeks before the operation, some of these edges from the market graph come out. So the market graph edges are actually a superset of real compatibility. So that means that the cycle fails. But if you have a shorter cycle, the probability that the cycle, cycle fails is lower, and if it fails, a smaller number of people will be affected. So that's another reason why you don't want to go with long cycles. Um, so what about the complexity now of the uh, exchange clearing problem? Well, we proved that it's NP complete. Um, more specifically, deciding whether a directed graph has a perfect cover with cycles of length at most L is NP complete for any constant uh, where L is three or more. The reduction is from undirected 3D matching, and it, the obvious reduction doesn't quite work, so you need a little bit more of a subtle re a reduction. The interesting thing is that the problem is polynomial time. If L is two, so if you only allow two cycles, it's polynomial time, and if L is infinite, you don't have any cycle cap. It's also polynomial time. So it unfortunately happens to be that for the real problem where L is three, four, or five, it's NP complete. Approximation algorithms exist, but we want an exact algorithm. First of all, otherwise patients may die unnecessarily or will die unnecessarily. And as I'll show, we can make an algorithm that can solve this probably optimally at the nationwide scale, which is projected to be 10,000 pairs. Some prior work. Well, uh, people have looked at simulation of different kinds. Uh, there was a simulation paper by Segev et al that shows that with just 4,000 patients, uh, you get about $750 million of savings in healthcare costs. And that's just the cost of dialysis, really, uh, th that's saved there. It doesn't take into account the fact that you get quality of life improvement, and these people who are on dialysis are now working and being productive members of society. In reality, the market, as I mentioned, is going to be probably about 10,000, so this is an underestimate that in that sense as well. Roth et al. showed that... Uh, you can actually get significant gains with allowing three cycles instead of, instead of just restricting to two cycles. Um, the current state of the art, um, at least before we showed up on the scene, was that there were three kinds of approaches to solving the exchange problem in kidney exchanges in practice. And in the US, there's a handful of kidney exchanges. They're all relatively small. The biggest ones run pools of about 150, 200. Um, I'll talk about the UNO setting up a nationwide kidney exchange towards the end of the talk. The, most of them did manual matching or some sort of a greedy heuristic algorithm that doesn't find the optimal solution and the manual approach doesn't scale. Then people used maximal weighted matching which finds the optimal answer for two cycles but can't handle more than two cycles. That can be solved for example with Edmonds algorithm from 65. And then um, the most advanced prior exchanges use CPLEX, which is an integer programming general purpose package. Um, and as I'll show, it doesn't scale beyond 600 or nine to 900 pairs. That's where it, uh, where it chokes. Uh, the nice thing is that it can handle any cycle cap, and it has the same flexibility as our algorithm. Otherwise, it just doesn't scale to the nationwide size. The interesting thing about this problem is that unlike in winner determination in combinatorial auction uh, auctions where the bottleneck is time. Here, space becomes the bottleneck first. And what I'll show you is an algorithm that can actually solve the problem provably optimally without ever writing the problem down. So you can't ever write the problem down because it would be too big. So first I'm going to show you an approach 
Yeah. The space is a bottleneck. You're talking gigabytes, terabytes, uh, petabytes. Pick, pick, your, pick your favorite. So uh, uh, in, in my lab, we have the biggest computer we have is about 128 gigabytes of RAM, uh, so a supercomputer. And, and it's really, um, you, when, when I'll show you the reason why, you'll just see that, OK, well, that's how it has to be. You can't write the problem down. The, the, it, it's just too big. Um, but first, uh, let me uh, talk about our first approach. And now I'll have to preface this that this didn't really work that well. Uh, the first approach was um, uh, what we call the edge formulation of the problem. And it's motivated by this special case where there's no limit on cycle length. So we can take the original market graph and put the uh, agents as red nodes into a new graph. Let's say that these are the recipients. And then we have the donors here in, as items in the blue ones. And uh, we'll for every compatible edge, uh, we'll put an edge in this graph, and then we'll put these incompatible uh, edges of weight zero uh, between the donor and his incompatible pair. And then we can look for a perfect matching in this bipartite graph. And that will give us the right answer uh, in the case where we have no limit on cycle length in polynomial time. So we took that uh, type of idea and formulated it as an integer, logical, uh, integer linear program, ILP, uh, in this edge formulation. Of course, now we really put in the cycle cap. The objective is to maximize the sum over the edges, or the weight of the edge, times the decision variable of whether you're taking the edge or not. One means that you're taking the edge in the solution. Zero means that you're not. Subject to con conservation of flow, so as many kidneys have to come into each edge just go out. And capacity, it, nobody can put out more than one kidney. Um, and then we have the limit on cycle length. For each non-cycle path of length L, we have to say that the sum of the variables is less or equal to L minus 1. Um, the ILP there is too large. There's too many constraints to write down. Uh, even with just 1,000 patients, there are 400 million length three paths. So we uh, tried the constraint generation approach. That's an incremental formulation where you begin with a small set of constraints, and then you repeat solving the linear programming relaxation and adding a subset of the violated constraints, if any. Um, we perform a branch and bound search, a tree search, doing the repeat loop above at every node. So that's a normal way of doing constraint generation in integer programming and search. Um, there are some techniques that we use to try to make it faster. One is that we seeded the constraint. We didn't, uh, constraints. We didn't start with an empty pool of constraints. Um, we forbid any non-cycle path of length L minus 1 that has no edge closing the cycle from its tail to head. And we also tried seeding with random constraints from the ILP. And then in the constraint generation, um, we find an length L path with value some more than L minus 1. Um, and we add the constraint. Observation here is that the long cycle C of length C contains C of these paths. So we went uh, into smaller numbers of constraints. So for example, in, on a cycle, the edge sum in a long fractional cycle can be at most the floor of this. So we put just one constraint instead of C constraints for these cycles. That gives us less constraints, but turned out, turns out to be slower in practice. So then we went the other way and said, OK, well, let's put in more constraints then and see, see if that helps. We added a constraint per violating path P and for each path with the same interior vertices. And that turned out to be faster, but it's still slow. So even after many improvements, we couldn't clear markets with 100 patients faster than the next approach that I'm going to talk about can clear the market with 10,000 patients. And I'll mention a theoretical justification why the next approach is better. <clears throat> the second approach is column generation. The first was constraint generation. This is column generation. And this is motivated by uh, how you can formulate in polynomial time solvable way the case where the cycle length is at most 2. And what we do here, um, we put uh, 
the nodes of the graph into this new graph from the original graph. And then we put one undirected edge for each cycle of length at most two. So for example, for this cycle C1, there's an edge here. For this cycle C2, there's an edge here. And for this cycle here, there's an edge here. And for the big cycle, of course, there's no edge because that's longer than two. And then um, the exchanges correspond to matchings in this graph. And again, we can use standard matching algorithms to find optimal matching. But again, uh, we want something that works for any cap L. So we need to formulate that, this as an integer linear program. Uh, but we use this idea that uh, decision variables are cycles. So we'll say that CL is a set of cycles of length at most L. We'll have one variable for each cycle C in CL. <coughs> we want to maximize over the, sum of, over the si sum over the cycles of the weight of the cycles, weight, weight of the cycle times the decision variable of the cycle. Again, one means that the cycle is in the solution and zero means it's not. Subject to the constraint that um, uh, the sum over cycles that, in that include vertex vi has to be smaller than one. Again, that's a constraint that every uh, pair can be involved in at most one cycle. And of course, the cycles have to be out or in. They can't be partially in. Any questions on this? And this is a formulation that we'll really be working with. And now we're going to be adding smarts on top of this to make this tractable. You can see that um, CL will grow rapidly. So even if you have uh, L being three, there's already a cubic number of cycles. And if you have 10,000 pairs, it's 10,000 to the third in the worst case. And now you start to be uh, beyond what you can even write down. Um, let's compare the two different formulations, cycle formulation and edge formulation. The cycle formulation has fewer constraints, but more variables. And a variable is a column in the uh, integer program. Furthermore, uh, we proved that the cycle formulation linear program gives upper bounds that are no worse than the edge formulation. In other words, the cycle formulation gives tighter upper bounds and therefore smaller search trees because search trees use the upper bounding to prune. And why is that? Well, you can easily see that any solution that's valid in the cycle formulation, you can convert to a valid so, uh, form, uh, solution in the edge formulation, but uh, the reverse isn't true. So for example, um, think of a cycle of length n. In the uh, cycle formulation, the optimal solution would be zero because uh, you couldn't take that cycle because it's longer than L. In the edge formulation, on the other hand, you can take half of every node in the LP. So that just says that cycle formulation gives you tighter bounding. And uh, that bears out also in the, uh, in the speed, as I mentioned. What, what we can do in the cycle formulation with 10,000 nodes, we couldn't even do 100 nodes in that time with the edge formulation. OK, so um, again, the linear program, so, sorry, the integer linear program is too large. Even with only 1,000 patients, there are 3 million cycles. And again, if you recall, we're trying to solve problems with uh, 10,000 patients. The overall approach that we take, therefore, is what we call branch and price. And it's an approach, a uh, relatively recent approach, starting in the mid-90s in operations research and integer programming, where you can actually find the provably optimal answer without writing the problem down exactly. So we adopted the approach here, plus we put in a lot of goodies on top of it to make it uh, fast enough in practice. So the idea is that we branch, like in the tree search, we'll select a fractional column from the LP. Fractional means that the LP value is not 0 or 1, it's somewhere in between. So the LP isn't sure whether it should be accepted or rejected. And we fix the value to 0 and 1 respectively. That's our branch. <coughs> And the search order is we'll do depth first search just to save memory. That's just a choice. You might go in other orders, but we do this just to save memory and because it worked. We fathom the search node if, no better, if it's no better than the incumbent. So that's a normal upper bounding rule. 
um, we solve for each node as LP relaxation using column generation. And that gives, the LP gives us the upper bound. And then we have some primal heuristics that search for integer solutions early at the nodes. And if they fo uh, are found, they constitute new incumbents and therefore better pruning later in the search. I'll talk about these in detail. So in the column generation, the master linear program, which we'll call P, has too many variables to write down, too many columns in other words, so it won't fit into memory and will, would take too long to solve even if it would fit. So we begin with a restricted linear program P prime, which contains only a small subset of the variables, i.e. cycles. And note that then the optimum solution for P prime is no greater in value than the optimum for the actual linear program. So we solve P prime and if necessary we add more variables to it, add more columns to it and we repeat until opt of P prime is probably the same as opt of P and then we're done with the node and continue with the search. The pricing problem then is to find a cycle or in other words a column <coughs> whose price which we define to be the weight of the cycle minus the sum of the dual var values of the nodes in the cycle uh, we want to find a cycle that has positive price or report that none exists. The key point here is that we can check the price of each cycle one by one in, by enumeration without having all the cycles in memory at once. And once we found a solution that doesn't have any uh, positive price cycles, we are done. We need some further techniques to um, improve this uh, pricing problem in speed. First of all, we generate cycles by depth first search over the input graph and we explore the vertices in non-decreasing order of their dual value. Therefore, the, that's because the earlier vertices are more likely to belong to a cycle with positive price and you can prune the depth first search path early since dual values never decrease down a path. We also avoid repeating work from one pricing problem to the next, meaning that as we move from one search node to another, uh, if a vertex's uh, dual value is unchanged and it was not the root of a positive price cycle before, it can't be now either and doesn't have to be checked. And finally, you might ask, how many columns do we add at a time? And here we add one. There's a trade-off. You might add more columns and be able to increase the opt of P prime more at the pop but on the other hand, if there aren't any positive price columns and you look for some, you're going to have to go through the whole list of columns before you're done. So therefore, we just do one at a time. Um, as I mentioned, once all columns have non-positive prices, we know that we have a probably optimal solution for the linear program at the search tree node. However, there's this tailing, effect, uh, tailing off effect, which is that we may have already found the optimal value for the linear program, but some columns still have positive price. And they are <coughs> often there's this problem that you need many iterations to prove optimality, although you really are there already. And there's no general solution for this problem, but uh, we developed some problem-specific techniques that work really well here. One is that um, <coughs> we relax the cycle length constraint, and this gives us a polynomial time upper bound through the edge formulation. And these length three cycles are usually enough to match the upper bound. So uh, we relax the idea of the cycle cap so that you can have any length cycles, but usually with three cycles you can already get there. So usually uh, the opt of P prime is going to match, match this and will uh, we'll be done. So that's another stopping criterion beyond all of the columns having non-positive price. There's actually an interesting side note that uh, in this um, uh, uncapped problem that we use for the stopping purpose, we use the edge formulation in the bipartite perfect matching graph that I showed you, but we use column generation there, which is exponential in the worst case, but it's much faster in practice than the best special purpose polynomial codes for this problem. Then column seeding, you could run the algorithm just as I mentioned, 
but we again don't want to start with an empty pool of columns. So we seed the columns pool with uh, some uh, seemingly good candidates. We get them uh, from a couple of different algorithms. One is a randomized greedy algorithm, and the other one is a maximal weighted matching algorithm with two cycles only that we discussed. And then we throw in a randomish selection of a large set of cycles just to start the pool from its final size of, uh, instead of starting from empty. And this uh, improves speed. Then we need column management. Once our column pool is as big as we allow it to grow based on our memory requirements, we need to somehow delete columns as we uh, want to put in new ones through the column generation. And um, the neat thing here is that only a small fraction of the columns end up in the final solution of the optimal problem. So even if we delete some, it's unlikely that we'll delete any of the important ones. And even if we do, they'll be gen generated again through column generation if, if we happen to run into that case. And in particular, we delete the column with the largest negative price first, as this is the most satisfied constraint in the dual. Then primal heuristics. Again, the goal is to construct integer solutions uh, at nodes from the fract fractional optimal solution for the LP so that we get a lower bound, a new incumbent, if you will, for the integer program and more bounding later on. We have two types of primal heuristics. One is a rounding heuristic where we include all of the cycles with value at least a half and greedily select remaining cycles. It re rarely actually helps pruning. Our better primal heuristic is the following. It's kind of where usually actually turns out that P prime at the root node usually contains enough columns so that the integral opt can match the fractional opt. Um, we use Cplex's MIP solver as a primal heuristic at nodes, but only on the restricted ILP that corresponds to the restricted linear program P prime. And there it's faster than our own tree search algorithm. We also made it faster further by saying that we have to have a constraint that the ILP value has to match the fractional target. If we already fall short of that, we can stop the search for the um, primal heuristic. And then we have a time limit, and we only do the primal heuristic if the problem is sufficiently different from the previous problem. So we don't keep wasting a lot of time in back-to-back -back search nodes. And this improves speed significantly. When we do experiments, we experiment using a market generator that's been developed by others, by Sidman et al. in particular. And it's based on data from the United Network for Organ Sharing, where you have the real distribution of blood types and tissue types in the population, and so forth. The idea there is that you generate these patients and donors from the real population, see if they're compatible, and if those aren't, they aren't compatible, then they join the exchange. If they're compatible, they'll just do their own live donation pairwise. So this gives pretty realistic data. Why didn't we use real data? Well, because there aren't real kidney exchanges at this scale. The biggest kidney exchange problem that we've solved for real had 158 pairs. So uh, again, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. There weren't any nationwide kidney exchanges because there wasn't the technology to run them. On the other hand, to benchmark the technology, you need the data. So it's just like in combinatorial auctions, as we proceeded, we generated uh, artificial data, honed our algorithms on that, and then uh, did it live. So if you take one slide from this talk, this is a slide to remember. Uh, this is an experiment uh, on speed. On the x-axis, we have the number of patients. Uh, each point is uh, uh, different from the next point. Um, so this isn't like we're adding patients. These are different instances. Actually, the average is over multiple instances per point. We have the clearing time on the y-axis. So this is a time in seconds it takes to run the algorithm, i.e. to find the provably optimal answer. So we have uh, here, we have the basic cycle formulation, which is the better formulation, but just fed to Cplex uh, without any of this uh, um, technology that I've been talking about. And you can see that uh, depending how much time you allow, it might get to 600 or 900 patients before it, uh, um, it dies. On the other extreme, we have our algorithm with all the goodies. And you can see that we can get to the whole 10,000 in uh, 
much less, in about one hour. Then uh, in between, we have our algorithm with a restricted column seeder where we have no random columns. You can see that it does worse. And we have one with no optimality prover. And again, you can see that it does worse in speed. Any questions on this? Eric. Do you have any graphs that would show um, how much better the exact computation does compared to the leading approximations that have been out there? No, I don't. Uh, the, the leading approximation algorithms that people have used aren't really published. People kind of shy away. They use the word optimization, although it's not really optimization, and then they do some manual thing that's not really well defined, or they have some sort of very greedy uh, algorithm that they run, and they're not really published. So I can't really, I don't have anything real to compare against. So you have no idea? No right. idea. There are studies that others have conducted, like, for example, Al Roth's group. They've looked at what can you do if you allow just two cycles. So you use, for example, Edmund's algorithm, versus what can you do if you allow three cycles. Right, so so there's, 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 there's been work on that. And what does that tell us? It tells, uh, I, uh, even the work with just two cycles is already much better than manuals or the greedy algorithms. And that I don't know how much better, but that's already better. But we, we know that we can even improve from there by three cycles. Any other questions on this? Okay. Well, the short of it is that now it's possible to run kidney exchanges at the nationwide scale. Uh, let's talk about some additional functionality of modern kidney exchange that our algorithm supports. One is allocation level side constraints. So you can put any side constraints you can express in a linear form into the linear program, unlike the classic uh, weighted maximal matching algorithms. So for example, you might say that one center doesn't want cycles longer than two, another center doesn't want cycles longer than three. Uh, a particular region of centers must get at least seven or at most seven operations. Each center gets at least as many operations that it would get if it operated individually. This is very important from a finance perspective. Um, center C does not want to participate in altruistic donor change of length greater than three. I'll talk about what that is and so forth. You can also incorporate compatible pairs. So why would a compatible pair join a kidney exchange? Because they can do the transplant just wife and husband directly. Well, it may be that the patient can get a better kidney uh, that matches more closely, less HLA incompatibility, for example. Also, others in the exchange may benefit. You might get more matches or better matches for other people by allowing these uh, incompatible players to come in. And in some of the kidney exchanges that we've run, we've actually had this. We've allowed these incompatible people to come in with the understanding that you know, if they don't get something within, say, three months, they're going to do it themselves. Um, the value and the trades when it comes to the romantic slash family connections versus the more slightly ideal histic compatibility. Yes. Between tissue types. Yes. So there's there's also that uh, kind of emotional thing that you know if if I'm getting a kidney from somebody who's close to me, I know that you know they, they haven't been using intravenous drugs and they haven't been doing these other risky things. So I know more, but maybe it's not as HLA compatible. So which do I prefer? Do I prefer to take somebody who's bit a better HLA match, but there's some uncertainty and so forth. So, so on that front, how good are the models these days for making predictions of compatibility and the trades that come with that? Yeah, how much is in that? That's, that's a fantastic question. So the, uh, so the medical knowledge is incomplete. Uh, there are a certain number of things that people measure, the doctors measure, out of, uh, or the labs measure, out, out of the blood type and tissue type. But I'm sure there are other parameters that we don't even know about. We, and just to give you a sense of that, if everything looks OK, it may still not be OK in the last minute cross match. So, so the, there's this very crude thing of actually mixing up the blood and see if they coagulate at the end, uh, which is beyond our ability to medically explain. But they do that as kind of a safety gap at the end. Even if that succeeds, sometimes you get rejection at the end. So the, uh, the medical knowledge is pr uh, progressing. Uh, and there's two things that are happening. One is that knowledge of incompatibility gets better. So some of the edges from the graph disappear, which makes our matching problem harder. On the other hand, 
the immunosuppression side is getting better. So you can, uh, you, you, you can do matches of lower quality, which increases the number of edges in the graph and makes the matching problem, uh, makes it more likely that you can match more people. So it goes both, way, both ways. Um, and different centers use different technologies for determining compatibility. So that's actually one of the challenges in setting up a nationwide exchange is that we have to have some sort of minimal common denominator as to what is getting measured and the definition as to what's okay, what's not okay. Different transplant centers have different levels of match as their minimum criterion. So some transplant centers will do a worse quality match than others. But imagine there's ongoing science when it comes to monitoring given the input uh, tissue types and, and the, you know, the new compatibilities, how well things go over time since the learning is ongoing learning. So that's, that's, my, that's my view of this, is that uh, I, uh, uh, where do these, well, our algorithm takes us input to edge weights. It's basically saying, okay, how good is this match if we do it? So our algorithm that we've been talking about so far is agnostic to where those numbers come from. But currently they come from very ad hoc expert systems, kind of scoring rules really. And I don't mean scoring rules in the game theoretic sense. I mean just I doctors giving numbers to, you know, how important is this thing versus that thing. Uh, my view is exactly what you said, that we should really have machine learning in the loop, have patient attributes, donor attributes, and then have a survival, possibly quality, life, quality adjusted life years, yeah. or maybe not quality adjusted, but life years in any way, and get that, uh, get that prediction going from first principles. And there's uncertainty um, in high variance, the idea of actually where there is not an obvious gain or loss of doing value information and assigning kidneys to learn. Yes, that's, 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 that's uh, this kind of system level thinking. I've actually thought that maybe I should write an article about it, because when I go there, you know, the doctors uh, don't like that view. I'm not sure they understand it, but they certainly are not willing to experiment. Well, it's, it's the idea of, of posing it, I think, as an approach to clinical trials. Yeah. By saying that we're going to randomize in particular ways within a constrained optimization with, within bounds. Yeah. Now, one might say that if one's getting a kidney, one's not in the mood to do a clinical trial. Yeah. By, by randomizing the kidney and so on. But within, some, but within the current uncertainty, it might be okay. But the, even without, the, that's the exploration part. But even without exploration, I, uh, I think even if we took it as a constraint that you can't explore, you have to somehow just take the best match always. Uh, even there, machine learning could yeah, play a role. Go this track, absolutely. So I hope, I hope the data has been collected. At least. Yeah, probably uh, to different extents, because there's no official follow-up on these things. So. Uh, you don't really know. That's the paper you write. Uh, what? This, is, this is down in the noise pitch of that paper. We have to, we have to do some follow-up. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's actually, uh, so some of the people working uh, at UNOS in the same, same committee that I'm there, they, they realize that, that the follow-up follow is a main shortcoming. Another shortcoming is this histology testing. You've got to get better and uniform testing. Um, Anyways, uh, you can incorporate in, uh, compatible pairs into these exchanges with this algorithm. And you could also program in the constraint that the compatible patient gets at least as good a match in the exchange as she would get from her own donor. Then list exchanges, you can also uh, integrate this with uh, the uh, deceased donor waiting list. And actually, I think in the long run would be the right thing to do is to optimize the pair donation together with the list exchange so the cadaver kidneys are in play at the same time. And this is, there's a little bit of list exchange stuff happening in New England, but by and large for the nationwide pool, this is very far away. And, and there are some reasons why people want to keep those two separate. Yes? Uh, okay, I wasn't going to really go into this. Um, uh, th this is, you, you could think of it as a, the, the waiting list. Uh, where people are waiting for kidneys. And there's, uh, UNOS sets these priorities as to who's going to get what. And it has to do with blood type. It has to do with waiting time. Uh, the longer you waited, the higher your priority, et cetera, et cetera. The idea here is that if, if 
my wife needs a kidney, say. This is all hypothetical, by the way. Nobody in my family has kidney disease. But uh, uh, let's say my wife needs a kidney. So I could donate to the list, and we could have a mechanism that therefore my wife jumps to the head of the queue. So that's kind of a, a little bit, uh, that, that's the kind of least exchange that they're doing at NEPCI, which is the New England Paired, paired Kidney Exchange. Um, you could even go further. You could just say that you optimize the waiting list and the kidney exchange holistically together. And that's where I think it should go in the long run. That would be the best for everybody. But uh, there are lots of reasons why that's not how it's done. One practical reason is that when you get the cadaver kidney, the clock is ticking. Uh, you, you don't really have time to organize massive, massive coordination and testing and so on on the fly. You, you, it, it has to pretty much be a dispatch policy. Do, do you have a sense for the percentage of cadaver kidneys that come from trauma, unexpected deaths versus um, other kinds of deaths? Right, more, more plans? You can actually say there's a kidney. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. The the. I would suspect, though, that that wouldn't help much. Because um, when you have a planned death, that means that you're either sick or you're old. Both are reasons why the kidney in you is bad. So uh, an old person's kidney isn't going to last a lifetime if put in a young person. So the kidneys have a certain duration. Actually of cancer. And cancerous uh, kidneys also, also. That's a very risky thing. Yeah. There, there are certain hard things like HIV. So people won't transplant an HIV person's kidney. Well, they don't want that kidney. No, I'm not sure if there's somebody who wants it either, but, but there could be, hypothetically, if they can't get anything else. But, but that's not something that's done. The kidney's been washed and dried, cleaned up, so it's ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, retool, refurbished. Um, okay. Um, you can also have weighted edges and never-ending altruistic donor chains. So weighted edges just mean that not all donations are the same. So they could, you could have deg degrees of compatibility. So histological match could be of different degrees. And the better it is, the longer the kidney will survive. Or you could, there could be life expectancy improvements. So you could say, that, OK, if this person gets a kidney, how long would he live? If he doesn't get a kidney, how long would he live? And that's a delta in life expectancy. Oftentimes, the younger the person, the bigger the delta. There are other reasons why the delta can change, but you might prefer people where they can make good use of the kidney for a long number of years. Or wait time. Uh, the cadaver queue, oh, sorry, I shouldn't use that. The disease donor waiting list uh, prioritize people who, waited a long, who have waited a long time. Well, I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. That's a fairness notion. It's not an efficiency notion. Uh, travel distance, we talked about that. I personally don't think that that should be taken into account, but some kidney exchanges do take that into account. And they don't take it into account. Well, I, let's leave it at that. Uh, then another argument you could use is the hardness of matching the patient or the donor in the future. So if you have a blood type O donor, that's a very flexible donor. It could be matched to a lot of people. That would be a valuable donor for the future. So maybe even if we could match him today, Maybe we should wait and get a better match, more matches in the future. Or a donor, a patient that's hard to match. If you can match him today, hey, let's match him today versus three others that are easy to match in the future. Then here's a really fun thing. And this is the uh, um, New England Journal of Medicine article that came out this month that Eric alluded to, that we did. Uh, this is the idea of a never-ending altruistic donor chain. So now scratch a lot of what I've said so far and think that there's a nice person out there who's going to just come into the exchange and say, OK, I only need one kidney. I'll be fine with one. I'll give a kidney to anybody, and I don't need one in return. Just one person like that. OK? What we can do, we can take that person and start a chain in the network instead of a cycle. And uh, this is actually a real chain that we've done over the last two, two years um, of 10 people so far. There are other chains that we've started. Um, so here, an altruistic donor came in uh, in Arizona they, uh, to give this to this person in Arizona. That person's, that wife's husband gave to somebody in Ohio. 
uh, that was a daughter-mother deal. Then the mother gave to somebody in Ohio, again, a uh, mother-daughter deal this time, and so forth. And, 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 and you don't have to see the whole chain. You just have to see to some point in the chain. We didn't plan this whole chain up front. We didn't have visibility to these new patients and donors. Uh, we just saw a little bit of the chain. And then at the end of the chain in our current patch, there's a leftover kidney from the pair who received but didn't donate yet. That becomes what we call the bridge donor, just a sec. Bridge donor, and then in the next batch, we use that bridge donor as the altruistic donor. By batch, I mean we run this algorithm maybe every six weeks. Uh, and this is a gift that keeps giving. The, this, uh, this chain potentially never ends. The only way it would end is if somebody says, that, oh yeah, now I'm the scumbag. Uh, my wife got a kidney. I have second thoughts I'm not going to keep. But, but, uh, but the, that, the, if you do the chain atomically within the current batch, then that risk of backing out only happens with the bridge donors. And you can be careful about who you make the bridge donors in the optimization. So you can put weights on different people depending on, uh, for example, uh, uh, blood type. I might want a, the bridge donor to be an O blood type because that's a very flexible bridge donor for the future. Or I might want to say, OK, well, this person is kind of iffy, iffy based on these psychological tests. So let me do him now and save this more stable, uh, more reliable person for the future, and so forth. Question? But you said before that all the transactions have to have, have, to have a simultaneous. That's why I said so for, for here, it, it's, here. Here it doesn't happen, right? There here it there. only happens atomically within a batch. And the bridge donor doesn't happen atomically. The next part of the batch happens atomically again. So you're right. I mean, there is a risk that the bridge donor will back out. But it's not as bad as backing out of a cycle. Because if somebody backs out of the cycle, it means that some other pair has lost their bargaining chip. They've lost their kidney, and they're done. They didn't get anything. They lost a kidney. Here, no pair has lost their bargaining chip. I mean, it's still a shame that the chain doesn't continue, but that's all it is. Well, do you, do you, have you tried backing this up to actually request the, the, the original altruistic donor? They might turn out that depending on the type you actually get for the altruistic donor, it changes everything. Yeah, so, so we're, we're this by actually going back out and saying, I want this kind of altruistic donor. Well, I, 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 the view here is that, uh, first of all, that there even are altruistic donors. Uh, they have to go through severe psychological tests uh, just to make sure you know people don't have kind of a weird moment and they give out the organs. So, uh, uh, but, but when Mike Reese from the Alliance for Pair Donation did nationwide TV shows uh, on this chain, we got 200 people registering into the exchange as altruistic donors within like a couple of weeks. So there's a lot of willingness out there to become an altruistic donor. And we can put all of them in the optimization. So it's not like we pick one of them. We put all of them in the optimization and then said, OK, find me the best set of cycles and chains. Because the optimizer handles a uh, chain just like a cycle, except that there's a phony edge coming back. So optimization works so, directly. So tell me again why we can't pay money for the altruistic donor in a chain like that. You're not allowed to uh, pay, pay money legally in the U.S. and most other countries for uh, organs. Why is that? Well, it's, why is that? That's a good question. I mean, now, you, now you're getting, like Iran, for example, they allow that. So, so it's not an uh, international thing. Every country has different laws. Most countries think that it's immoral. Because well, what, what ends up happening, richer people buy poorer people's organs. And you might argue from an efficiency perspective that that's the right thing that should happen. But now you're talking about very ethically questionable issues. So uh, the, the most countries take the position that that's not morally right. What do you think? Oh, oh. I, I, I need to be agnostic. I, I can't, can't take sides on that. <laughs> what? You can speak as an individual, not, not as a presenter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, all, all of the issues involved. It's interesting to think about whether or not the decision analytic approach to compensation might not be unethical, might be just fine. But, but the idea is to actually work out the details of kind of the downside of doing that for, for the socioeconomic issues. 
Yeah. There, there are villages in India where every male has a scar in their back because everybody has sold a kidney. It, it becomes so prevalent really? that, that, yeah, that, yeah. that it becomes kind of almost a moral thing that there's peer pressure that you have to do it. I don't think it's even legal there, but people do it anyway. And, and this is the reason why Iran went this direction. There was so much of it happening illegally that they felt that, okay, well, moral or not, it's better to make it legal, make it safe, and make it more fair. Uh, because when it's illegal, the brokers get even a bigger fraction than the donors. And when you make it legal, it kind of tilts the table a little bit in the donor's favor. Uh, but, but still. Do you know what the is going on in this country? I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure. I don't know of any cases directly, but uh, uh, you know, I've read in the New York Times, there was actually a couple of years ago, New York, what's it called, the monthly, New York Times magazine. There, there was an article about how Americans go to Turkey uh, to do this with Israeli surgeons and stuff like that so for about $100,000. So if you're desperate, that's what people do. And this is one of these approaches that we're trying to make that not happen, that you can actually do this legally. Okay, uh, you can value uh, in the algorithm differently, not using up different altruistic donors. So for, for an old owner, you might prefer to have them in the future, and you can take it all into account in the cycle weights. Uh, similarly, valuing differently different leftover kidneys. So you might prefer bridge donors of type O, you might, uh, might prefer A's and B's over AB's, uh, you might prefer people who you think are not likely to pull out, and so forth. But now, I, I talked on this slide, I talked a lot about weights. And a lot of these weights have to do with, of course, just immediate quality of match. But others have to do about the future. Who do we make the bridge donor or uh, hardness of matching patients and donors in the future, even without altruistic donors? And what I found unsatisfactory is that these numbers that we used in these optimizations were kind of ad hoc. The surgeons helped us put together some numbers, but they were ad hoc and they weren't really tied to any sort of direct objective. So let me, in the final part of the talk, talk about the online problem. Could we automatically think about this not as a batch problem, but as this online problem, dynamic problem, where new donors and patients and altruistic donors are coming in over time and existing patients are dying at some death rate. And think about managing this pool, so instead of us depleting the pools, with the best possible matches today, like most of the current kidney exchanges do. Think about keeping the pool rich enough so it, we don't get this oversensitized population of uh, patients in the pool. And also so that we don't have to put in weights, but somehow the system will automatically figure out what's the value of the future compared to the present. And um, the first observation here is that there are no good prior free online algorithms for the problem. And, uh, the first proposition that we have says that no deterministic prior free algorithm can achieve a competitive ratio better than the cycle cap divided by two. And here's a simple example. So let's say that we have this AB cycle available today, but this uh, B pair is disappearing in the next step. And then we might get this uh, long chain L or might not. So if we take this short pair, we get two. And the worst case then is that the adversary is going to give us this L, but now we've already used up A, we can't get it. So we get this ratio L over 2. If, on the other hand, we decide to wait and not take this B, let this B disappear, the adversary won't give us L, and we're going to get an unbounded regret. Similarly, this, uh, you can prove a bound for randomized algorithms as well. Now we're in a little bit better position, and we can decide with some probability B, P, we take B, and one with probability 1 minus p, we don't. We set p just to keep the adversary indifferent between bringing in the new cycle L or not. And that gives us a bound of 2 minus 2 di uh, divided by L. So again, you can't really get a very good competitive ratio without using priors. The good news is that we have priors. We have very good knowledge about the tissue type and the blood type in the population. UNOS has all of this data. So we can use this distributional data and what we do this is a skeleton and we have several different instantiations which we'll talk about in a second. At each step of the algorithm, uh, or each time step if you will, we draw sample trajectories from the distribution of what few different futures. Then we leverage our offline algorithm to pick an action 
just an action, the next action to take, not the whole policy into the future, just an immediate myopic action. And then uh, we'll say that the actions are cycles, not combinations of cycles. The first algorithm like this in this family is an adaptation of the regrets algorithm by Bent and Van Hentenrick and Mercier and Van Hentenrick. Here, we just initialize all the cycle scores to zero. Using the probabilistic model, we generate the scenarios into the future, some number of scenarios m. For each scenario, we then solve the offline problem for the scenario. And for the cycles in the, that are accepted in that solution, we add to the cycle score the value of the solution of the offline problem. And for the other uh, cycles, we subtract a small delta from their value. Then at the end, we run another integer program to determine a set of vertex disjoint cycles with the maximum score and return it, again using our offline algorithm. So this, while we, my, while we pick just one action, it's not a myopic pick. It takes into account the possible futures. This, uh, we proved that algorithm one is not optimal, however. The improvement idea here is to optimize the scenarios for each action separately instead of optimizing each scenario separately. Um, that gives us algorithm two. Again, it starts the same, initialize to zeros the scores, uh, draw the sample trajectories, and then uh, we, instead of solving the actual trajectory, we, for, we solve for each trajectory with the cycles minus the cycle C. Then we set the score of C to be its original score plus the value of this. And we do that for each scenario and for each cycle. And then again, using the integer program, we determine a set of vertex disjoint cycles with maximum score. And the final um, algorithm that's a stochastic online algorithm like this is called AMSA, or this is really an adaptation of AMSA. There's some theory that's been built now for these online algorithms um, that are based on these trajectories. And there's this notion of global anticipatory gap. And roughly speaking, it means that we have a high gag if no action is pretty good across all the scenarios. And it's likely that here that's going to be the case. And this analysis applies to algorithms one and two. AMSA was designed to really deal with problems with a large gag. So we wanted to try that as well. And what it does, it again uses a model to draw the trajectories. But then it treats the trajectories as a reality builds a Markov decision problem and solves a Markov decision problem uh, uh, and, and, and goes about it that way. So um, the experiments on the online algorithms, we used a real data set with 158 pairs and 11 altruistic donors and the artificial data set to uh, lo look at more scale using the Seidman generator again. This had 510 pairs and 25 altruistic donors. The death rate in all of these experiments was set so that 12% survive 10 years, which is the reality. Um, there were interesting parameters and trade-offs between them. One is the number of sample trajectories, how many trajectories we draw. The other one is how many steps do we draw in each sample. We, don't, we can't go infinitely deep. We have to cap that somehow. And related to that, there's a batch size. So you could think about it, how often do you run your algorithm? And uh, if you have a large look-ahead depth, then for a given number of samples, you have only sparse coverage of the sample space. If you have a big batch size, then for a fixed number of look-ahead steps, you can look deeper into the future and so forth. So there's trade-offs. And when we benchmark against the offline algorithm, we tweak the batch size for the offline algorithm uh, also. So now we actually get something to compete against that's better than the current practice where it's not optimized. Dummy action, um, algorithms one and the offline algorithm can decide to wait anyway, so they don't need a dummy action. But for algorithms two and three, we include the possibility of a dummy action, which means that in this time step, I'm not doing any transplants. I'm just going to wait. And that improved performance a little bit. So in all of the rest of the experiments, we include the dummy actions. And here's the bottom line. Um, all of the online algorithms outperformed the offline algorithm on both data sets except that AMSA didn't scale to the real problem size. Um, algorithm 2 performed the best, surprisingly better than AMSA, and it scaled to both problems. And we get 16.6% uh, or 13.6% in uh, 
performance improvement over the online algorithm. And this is in steady state. We can also see that the advantage starts from the get-go even before steady state is reached. So let me conclude. Uh, we talked about the first algorithm that can clear kidney exchanges optimally on a national scale. Key points were incremental problem formulation, so you can actually uh, solve the problem optimally without ever writing it down completely. Key to that was uh, the branch and price framework, but exploiting problem-specific upper bounds and other techniques in several ways. It also supports generalizations like weights, never-ending altruistic donors, uh, compatible pairs, list exchange, and so forth. The trajectory-based online algorithms leverage distributional information, and they also leverage our offline algorithm in the inner loop, and then they do better than the offline algorithm. We're working with real kidney exchanges. We started working with the first one about two and a half years ago. Um, UNOS, United Network for Organ Sharing, is setting up a US-wide kidney exchange, and they've decided to, use our, decided to use our algorithms to run it. I'm helping them to design uh, the exchange on a committee. Future research, one issue is cross-match failures and testing. I mentioned this coagulation test. But right now, how it's dealt with, the optimizer doesn't really understand it. It's basically optimizer is just looking at the problem before the test. And then when the test shows incompatibility, what do you do then? Do you re-optimize the whole network? Well, that's an, at least at a nationwide scale, that's a huge nightmare logistically, and so forth. So can we somehow make robust plans that are robust to these cross-match failures? I mentioned that the short, short cycles help that, but can we more systematically take that into account? Or can we come up with testing plans so that we would actually test the cross-matches, not just on the planned transplants, but for a broader set of potential transplants so that we have good uh, backup recovery in, in uh, case of failure. And the other interesting thing is more of a game theoretic thing. So normally in exchanges, game theory is a big issue. Buyers will over ask, oh, under bid and sellers will over ask and so forth. Here, because we're not asking the patients anything, we're measuring all of their private information with blood tests and tissue tests. There's no game theory problem there at the level of patients and donors. But there is a problem of game theory with the transplant centers. So if you're a transplant center, you have your own pool. Would you reveal the whole pool to the exchange? Maybe you want to run your own little exchange first internally and see which transplants you can do locally and get all of the money for the transplants and then put only the refrat that you couldn't match into the nationwide pool. So can we somehow provide incentives to the transplant centers to reveal everything? And one method, a practical approach is to say, okay, we're somehow going to audit them. And if they get caught of doing that, there's going to be hefty penalties. You could also try to do something more game theoretic. Um, there are some impossibility results about this, for, by the way. But you could try to do this in the optimizer and say, okay, we're going to look at optimize every transplant center's pool separately, see how many operations they would have gotten, and then put that in as a constraint into the nationwide optimization that every transplant center gets at least as many operations as they would have had gotten operating individually. So that's kind of a fairness issue in money sharing between transplant centers. Of course, any constraints you put in the global optimization is going to be worse for the patients. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? So when is this going to go online? Um, so we've been off and on, we've been online. So there's no online system. So the kidney exchanges that run off and on. And we've been helping them on, on, on that uh, uh, for the last two and a half years off and on. The UNOS kidney exchange. Uh, um, there's a pilot program that's supposed to go live in September, October. And then the Nationwide Kidney Exchange is planned to start in March 2010. Maybe an obvious question, but are Can they... Can you speak up a little bit? Sorry. Um, are there any plans to do an international exchange, or does that exist? Oh, that's a great question. So right now, UNOS does not have any plans, to my knowledge, to do an international exchange. With these... Uh, individual current 
kidney exchanges. I know that some of them have approached foreign countries to try to put together international pools. But to my knowledge, nothing like that is running yet. But that's a very interesting issue because then, then you have different laws entirely uh, to, to deal with and, and different, um, different types of constraints. I mean, religion also plays a big role in this. In different countries, uh, uh, whether it's okay to be an organ donor upon death, uh, that there's big differences between countries in um, cadaver, cadaver donation rates. Um, but uh, the, the pools, for example, in India, there's a huge pool for kidney exchange. So if we could integrate the US with India, that would be, at least in principle, uh, very helpful. The question then is, would, would a US person want to get um, kidney from the third world? I mean, if, if the choice is that or death, or that or dialysis, probably yes. But if the choice is that versus a US kidney, maybe, maybe they'll, take, they'll take a US kidney. Again, depending on the level of the HLA match and so forth. But there's very interesting issues in that. And I, I think in the long run, definitely that would be the best, best for the patients. But that's really in the long run. If you do it internationally, then doing it simultaneously is even harder because, you know, when it's day here, it's night over there. And ah, yes. That's, that's a good, good comment. Uh, there's something that's weird. I, there was some reason why in the U.S. they do it in the evenings anyway. Uh, it may, maybe it was that there's uh, more availability of operating rooms, but uh, I think that most of these are done in the evenings anyway. So you could say, it, okay, 6 p.m. In, in the U.S. and 6 a.m. in China. 6 p.m. were in the U.S. I think the three hours between coasts. Well, that, that's, uh, I'm not saying it always happens at 6 p.m., but I'm just saying that uh, I've heard stories that they tend to happen in the evenings for some reason. And I think it was the, uh, the reason was the operating room availability, but it may, maybe not. Uh, the thing is that you need to coordinate the operating rooms to be available simultaneously at these different hospitals. And each one of them has a local scheduling problem for the operating rooms and other resources. So you want to find a time when it's likely that you can get all operating rooms in all hospitals. And I think that was the reason why they waited for the evening time. There, um, yeah. Maybe kind of a weird question, but are there other kinds of um, transplants that you could exchange? So if I say, you know, give me your <laughs> kidney, I know somebody that can give me Oh, oh you're you saying, plasma. not, not kidneys plasma. for kidneys, but kidneys for liver lobes and kidneys for lungs and stuff like that. Exactly. Uh, it's not happening. It's, uh, but uh, you, 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 could, you could play around with the idea, like there is, uh, Liver lobe donation is becoming more popular. It's still liver lobes. So basically, you, you, you can take, a, cut out a part of your liver, and it will grow back. And furthermore, the, the part that you take out and transplant into somebody else, that will grow the whole rest of the liver around it. So, so that's, that's something that's happening. It's uh, much riskier than kidney exchange right now. Uh, kidney transplant is a relatively minor operation uh, compared to any other. Or, or, or. Uh, I, I, kidneys, you know, you, I, I'm not a surgeon, so, so now I'm really going, going out of my realm here, but it's basically you just yeah, snap yeah. it out and, and cut a couple of tubes and take it out. Uh, liver lobes, you have to actually Vascular. cut the liver in part, and, and, and that's, that's a much bigger thing and, and, and riskier. And of course, the liver easily bleeds a lot. Uh, so liver lobes is something that's happening. People are doing intestines, but only cadaver cadaveric, of course. Uh, whole intestines, combinations of intestines and lungs, hearts. So there's a lot of things, but those are, those are cadaveric. Of course, you can't donate a heart. Um, there's, a, there's actually, uh, Al Roth has this uh, n a new draft of a paper where he talks about uh, repugnant markets where repugnancy is a constraint on market design. Where, you know, well, 
it, it, it kind of starts from kidney exchange. Said, well, some people don't like kidney exchange. Somehow it doesn't, just doesn't feel right to exchange organs. Oh, but you know, when you hear this talk and it talks like this, you said, okay, well, lives are getting saved. Everybody's better off and so on and so forth. Then you go to the next level. Well, um, let's say it, you know, your child is in a car accident and loses both of his eyes. Would you exchange one of your eyes so that, uh, that your child could get an eye from somebody else? Would that be right? Well, what if your child has a heart problem and is going to die? Would you be allowed to give your heart to somebody else so that your child can survive? So, so it, 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 it ramps up pretty quickly uh, if, if you start to think about all, all of the possibilities. There is no plan uh, to do interorgan, and to my knowledge, there isn't even a plan for exchange for any other organ than kidney. But that's that's the world as we stand today. Things, things may change uh, in in the future, of course. Um, liver lobes, I think, is a particularly interesting thing if you can really make it safe, because again, that's one of those things where. You can cut out the lobe and live fine with what you have. That, that's a nice, if you think about the kind of Hippocratian oath, he, uh, that the doctor says that, you know, I'm not going to harm anybody. I'm not going to harm Eric even a little bit if I could help you a lot by doing so. So uh, the Hippocratian oath is completely against efficiency. Efficiency would say that we're going to sacrifice whatever so as to maximize overall utility. Uh, so, so the, 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 those are at odds. Here, you could say that maybe the doctors are a little bit violating the Hippocratian oath. That, well, Eric really would be better off with two kidneys. You know, if he had an accident and pierced one of his kidneys, it would be really nice to have the other one as backup. backup. And so, so that's already starting to push the boundary. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's been papers written just on the ethical issues. And, uh, and, uh, and I would argue that the things that have been published on that haven't really even touched some of the issues that we just talked about. So there's, there's, a, there's a whole ethical issue here. And the practice is moving uh, forward at a very rapid pace. This is going to be happening. These uh, algorithms are going to be automatically striking these trade-offs between different forms of efficiency and different forms of fairness. And uh, it's, it's very exciting. I mean, we could say, that, OK, well, shouldn't we understand all of the ethics before we let algorithms lose on this problem? Well, the uh, transplant surgeon who's manually making these matchings today, he's already making those trade-offs. He just doesn't know it. And so who's going to be tuning the parameters? So well, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get away from these uh, ad hoc weights. So I, I'm uh, in several ways. One is to try to tie the value of a cycle to actual survival and survival in years predicted based on donor and patient attributes. So that's kind of the machine learning box that I was alluding to. Uh, instead of having a doctor put in ad hoc weights, let's use some real data and machine learning to predict what sort of weights should be. Another example is that instead of having those weights on uh, who we should match now versus keep for the future, we have these online algorithms that don't require any such weights. They, uh, they just do these trajectories. And based on these trajectories, which are drawn off of the real distribution of blood type and tissue type and so forth, you can actually figure out what is the best balance of who to match now versus who to save for the future without having to have those ad hoc weights. So I'm all about trying to get away from ad hoc weights and trying to instead come up with the answers algorithmically. All right, well, well, I think we probably stop there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.